fairly startling inflation numbers at, as the headline econ information for the day. And also, I've been scratching my head wondering what would be the economic and real world impact on institutions, on markets, and on average working people if this uh, situation, shall we call it, in Ukraine or a similar one in Taiwan were to turn into open warfare. What would that mean for you and me? Let's ask Professor Richard Wolf, the economist, co-founder of democracyatwork.info, the author of numerous books, his latest, this, when The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. Uh, democracyatwork.info, rdwolf.com with two Fs, profwolf with two Fs on Twitter. Professor Wolf, welcome back. What do you think? Uh, inflation and war. Well, the inflation number coming in for January at 7.5% uh, year over year um, ought to make everybody, if they haven't already, sit up and take notice. I mean, this was not supposed to happen. We have not had this for quite a long, uh, quite a long time. Uh, the Federal Reserve and the government assured us that it wouldn't happen, or if it did happen, it wouldn't last and it wouldn't get bad. Well, everything they've assured us of is wrong. Their credibility could not be less <laughs> than what it is now. Um, for every piece of evidence these days that it won't last long or get worse, there's a counterpiece saying exactly the opposite. Um, all I can tell you is that wages um, are going up much more slowly than prices, which means the inequality that has dogged us for these last 40 years is also getting worse as it did across the two years of COVID and economic crash, uh, which puts the American economy in such danger that it, it is almost, it's almost enough to make people like me not want to talk to, to folks like you, Tom, because it is scary. And I, I don't wanna be an alarmist. I'm not that way normally. Um, but but I see around me a network of problems, many kicked down the road for a long time, many crashing in on us. We are a strong society. We could deal with one or two, but when you have this many, I mean, to give you one example, the Federal Reserve seems to be determined to raise um, interest rates uh, several times during 2022. Uh, we're more indebted as a society than we have ever been. The government has just crossed $30 trillion of debt. Corporations, because the government has been flooding the economy with money and driving interest rates down, every corporation that has had any kind of problem, technical problem, labor problem, market problem, has had the quickest, easiest, and cheapest fix available, borrow money. So they did. And our corporations are now swimming in debt alongside the government. We also have the report that over the last month uh, and over the last year as well, uh, homeowner debt and household debts are all reaching new highs. I mean, this is a society living on borrowed money, borrowed time, and if you raise interest rates, I shake my head. Where is the money going to come from? For the government, for the corporations, and for the households with which to pay the more expensive debt they have now accumulated if interest rates rise. The government can't go there. On the other hand, it can't leave it inflation. Because look at it this way. American goods are now rising at a 7.5% rate. The Chinese current inflation is under 2%. That means the cost of American goods is going up much faster than the cost of Chinese goods, which will make even more people, Americans included, shift from American goods to Chinese goods, and that's gonna be another problem. Wherever you turn, the problems are such that to solve one aggravates the other one, <laughs> And that's usually a sign of a system that is, to be as polite as I know how, in very deep doo-doo. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way to reduce inflation other than increasing interest rates? Yes, there is a classic way. I like to remind people that a conservative Republican named Richard Nixon did that 
back in August 15, 1971, when we had again a rising inflation, at that time even faster, uh, rising faster than it is now, uh, but not that much more fast, uh, faster. And he went on the radio and television, 15th of August, and he said, I now declare as president of the United States a wage price freeze which means as of tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, if you are a business uh, and you raise your prices, uh, you will be arrested and you will go to jail because you can't do that. And if you're a union, um, you can't push for a higher wage uh, for the same reasons with the same consequences. We're going to freeze it so it stops. By the way, worked like a charm within literally within hours this inflation was drastically reduced. Yeah, but the right wingers went berserk. I mean, I remember right. that very well. And he, he had backed off on that by, by the end of the year. That's right. It took a few months for the people who were enraged by this, particularly the big businesses, to, to scream and yell and get him to back down. But if you want to stop <laughs> a runaway inflation, that's certainly one way to do it. Yeah. And the the answer to the people who tell you right away, oh, that'll lead to problems, well, I have news for them. If you don't do something, you're headed for huge problems. I mean, we're already in it. Uh, let me take a step back and take off my economist hat. We have just put the American people through two of the worst years in this country's history. We've never had a public health disaster at the same time as an economic depression. That's really what we've had on a scale of the 1930s for the Depression and on a scale of the Spanish flu back in 1918 in terms of what COVID did. And to come after two years of that and say to the American working people, we're now going to smack you in the, in the face with an inflation well outrunning your wages. I mean, why are we surprised that people are quitting jobs in droves? Why are we surprised at the divisions and tensions in our society? We have let the economy become a place of grotesque inequality, grotesque problems for which no solutions are found except those that seem to make the situation worse. Uh, I don't mean to be an alarmist. Right. But I am, in fact, alarmed at the accumulation of problems and the absence of solutions. Yeah. Well, let's talk about war next week. I, I, I have one other question on this. The, the mechanism by which Nixon stopped inflation during that uh, period of time, I don't recall how long it was. I, I don't think it was more than 18 months or so. That he had That's that right. It was a little less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seemed to me that the mechanism was not the actual fiscal reality of companies stopping raising prices and, and raising wages, but rather it broke the psychology of inflation. It, it, it ended the belief that, oh my God, I got to stock up on stuff right away because the price is going to go up. And of course, the stocking up, the hoarding drove up the price. I mean, a lot of this came out of the, uh, the oil shock, right? Because the gasoline prices were echoing through the economy. And then it also, you know, on the wage side, well, you know, inflation isn't going to continue. So we're going to stop yelling about we want more, more, you know, more to renegotiate our contracts to have higher wages on the part of the unions. Was it mostly psychological or was it mostly actual, you know, I, physical is not quite the right word for when you're having, you know, talking about money here. But you know what I mean? Yes, uh, the general wisdom, and I'm, I, I can't do better than that uh, on this point. The general wisdom is you have to make it hard and real and a bit of a shock if you're going to then get the benefit of what you call the psychological adjustment. Right. People ratcheting down their expectations. Uh, that, that has to be believable. You can't declare a wage price freeze and then three weeks later uh, say, OK, uh, that's the end of that, because not only will that undo what you've just achieved, but will make any future effort you you make to stop it look like it's going to be the same game and therefore have no effect. So you really need to do the hard reel for a significant number, at least of months um, in order to have the psychological effect of making people right. re-examine right. their positions. Real, that, real, so. real quick, because we're, we're coming up on a break here. I've, I've, uh, I was writing this book on neoliberalism over the last year, and, and uh, as a result, read um, a whole lot of Milton Friedman, including his autobiography that he co-authored with his wife. 
Right. And he references that period in time. And, and he says that basically the reason why inflation exploded all the way into the 80s, up to, you know, 15, 16 percent, was because of Nixon's wage price controls and because after, you know, because he tried them and it caused everybody to be very, very focused on inflation. And for there was this period of time where everybody thought, okay, everything's good. And then as soon as the wage and price controls were lifted, people were like, holy crap, it's going to get bad because of the wage and price controls. What do you think? Uh, it makes no sense to me. Much of what Milton Friedman uh, did in his life didn't make much sense to me <laughs> I either. <agree. laughs> uh, but I, I think that's just fancy. He, he hates it when the government comes in. And his whole career is to say that whatever goes wrong in, the, in a capitalist economy is because of the government. He gives the capitalist system and the capitalists who run it a completely free pass. Everything they do is good. And if and we have a problem, if just get rid of the government and everything will get much better, you know. Yeah. That's so, economic fundamentalism. It's not analytics. Okay. Uh, great. Great to know. Uh, Professor Richard Wolf, uh, democracywork.info, Prof Wolf over on Twitter. Professor Wolf, thanks again for dropping by. Always great talking to you. My pleasure, Tom. Thank you.